Control your stress and enjoy your horse. Confident strategies for pleasure riding by Carl Greenwood. You become like the people you spend most time with. Choose wisely. Chapter one, influences. Learning to know horses, read them, handle them, ride and control them is quite difficult, non-linear and not always logical. It takes years of patience and persistence, but then that's part of the fun. During our journey, by definition, the learning experience will be filled with, well, experiences. Experiences from which we learn. And some of those experiences will be uplifting, some will be scary, some will bruise and some will make us laugh out loud for joy. If I was to ask you what makes your friends be your friends, chances are you'd reply with examples of similarities in your personalities, values, shared world outlook. As social beings, we find rapport and closeness with the people who we identify as like ourselves. We are fond of the people we are similar to, those to who we share values with. It's those people with which we share our anxieties and our worries, and in turn, we support them when things go awry. It's a thing called friendship, and we can laugh at ourselves and each other, and it's a wonderful thing. At our yards and with our horses, we find mutual support in our mutual successes and problems. The problem is, at our yards and with our horses, as at school, our friends are our friends. And our friends are not necessarily the best teachers. If I cast my mind back past more years than I care to admit to my school days, I had my friends on one hand and my teachers on the other, and never the twain would meet. I know that my school education would have been most unsatisfactory if myself and Wall, my best friend, had decided to just go and see what we could find to fill our lives and our minds with wander around the school and go with whatever we encounter. But I must give credit here where it's due. Wal did teach me how to do maths, so just so that we could finish quicker and play graph paper golf for the rest of the lesson. Sorry, Mrs. Williams. So just as our teachers are not our friends, our friends are not our teachers, and we might not necessarily always learn what we need to from them. So if our friends are not necessarily our teachers, we employ instructors instead to teach us the lessons of riding horses. Our teachers will teach us practically the correct methods to employ, how to correct the wrong experiences and build on the right experiences. There are many good and valuable instructors out there with great people skills and confidence giving strategies who may be employed by a client for one or two hours a week. For the remaining 166 hours of the week, we must rely on our memory, our own inner voices, or the insights from our friends and acquaintances. Our friends will share our experiences emotionally, and so far, so good. We can have fun, have joy, laugh, and generally enjoy convivial company. But what about when it comes to the emotion of confidence, or the emotion of fear? It's all very well for an experienced and accomplished instructor to say, on the practicalities of an exercise, sit up, pushing forwards, but what if you just, well, you just can't? Because your brain freezes up. Or maybe you can follow the instruction, but your body reacts quite differently when your instructor isn't there and you're on a hack on your own. My question in response would be, who do you surround yourself with when it comes to learning how to be confident, how to be practical about an emotion? Not studying how to ride as such, legs and hands like so, but studying how to be secure in the knowledge that you can apply the learning effectively when you need to. In fact, how to operate our brains as usefully as we operate our hands and legs. The people we ride out with are those who share our values most, our fears and successes. They may be the most wonderful people in the world, but think about them for a minute. Are they really the best source of information on confidence? Are they confident themselves? Do they communicate their strategies for confidence successfully? I would suggest that if they do communicate their strategies for confidence successfully, then you wouldn't be listening to this book. How about their fears? Do they communicate those effectively? 
perhaps backed up with stories and anecdotes. And if they do communicate their fears, undoubtedly there will be resonance with our own fears, which are then reinforced and backed up by a second and much valued opinion. I'll try to choose my words carefully here. It would never do to be perceived as having a go at your friends, and I'm not, of course. However, chances are your fellow riders are not your tutors in confidence. It's even possible that those you surround yourself with, and in the best of intentions, actually erode the confidence of those around them, even as they try to boost it. When we look for support in our darkest moments, friends will naturally empathise, usually in order to allow you to be kind to yourself, with such supportive phrases as, well it is scary, isn't it? Or, it's okay to be scared. Or, well we have to remember that horse riding is the most dangerous sport you can do. Is this ringing true? Scary subject. If an activity is scary or not, is purely subjective. It's an opinion. It may be scary to you or to your friend, but not to this person or that person. However, saying, well, it is scary, isn't it, is a reaffirming statement that the activity is scary, full stop. As a fact, this is scary. In that statement, there is no room for error. It is scary. And furthermore, it confirms that your friend finds it scary too. A far weaker but more truthful version would be, well, you find that scary in your opinion. In this version, it all sounds a little alien and heartless. And it's not really something you would expect a supportive friend to say. I'm sure they wouldn't be your friend for very long. There's no empathy and it's almost pointless to say and would be of little comfort. But it's the truth, is it not? You find that scary, whilst another might not. Equally, in other areas of your life, you're confident in areas that others may fear. For an easy example, we all have friends who are too scared to even go into a stable, despite our protestations that he wouldn't ever kick or bite and gives the most wonderful affection. We can clearly see that there's no danger in the situation. And that to then say going into our lovely horse's stable is scary, well, it's just not. What this realisation is pulling us round to is to acknowledge that the danger may be real, but the fear is not. It is dangerous to stand on a cliff edge and no one would argue with that. Whether the culprit of such personal risk was scared or not, the activity is dangerous. If I stood on a cliff edge anyway, my opinion would be that it is scary, while an extreme sports enthusiast standing next to me would not find it scary at all. In a climbing harness, however, there's no danger, but I'd still be scared. Standing on a cliff edge in a harness may possibly induce a great deal of fear, depending on the person, even though they know they cannot fall. The question that has real-world value is not is it scary? But instead, is it dangerous? Danger is real. Fear is not. To assess the danger level of something is an intellectual exercise. It's associated with words like caution and phrases such as taking precautions, risk aversion, assessment and prevention. None of these words or phrases have a particular emotional association with them. The recognition and assessment of danger is an intellectual exercise taking place in the intellectual and logical parts of our brain. In contrast, fear is an emotion and takes place, unsurprisingly, in the primitive parts of our brain. The associated words and phrases are loaded with emotion, Horrifying, terrifying, scared, paralysed with fear. Think about how we represent these concepts to ourselves. Have you ever been rooted to the spot with danger? No. But rooted to the spot with fear? Ah oh, yes, of course. Our emotions are not best placed to assess danger. 
and yet we justify our feelings of fear by linking them to the levels of danger, when in reality they are completely separate in all but the most extreme of circumstances. When the lion bounds through the door of the living room, then we can allow fear and danger to be regarded as the same thing. However, in most circumstances we encounter in our civilised and ordered society, fear and danger are in effect separate processes. The question is not whether or not an activity is scary, but whether the level of danger intrinsic to that activity is acceptable. Is what we're doing actually dangerous? Which brings us to the second sentence offered by our friends to justify their fear. Well, we have to remember that horse riding is the most dangerous sport that you can do. How often do you hear this statement uttered as an irrefutable fact? The vast majority of riders I speak with have heard this sentiment in one form or another. The most dangerous sport, activity or hobby that one can do. The unreal fear of riding now has been linked by our associates to the no-nonsense factual reality of danger. Does this sound familiar? Of course horse riding is in the list of the most very dangerous of sports. In fact, horse riding is at the top, depending on which list you search Google for. However, in some listed top tens of dangerous activities, horse riding doesn't even feature. In some, it's disappointingly low down the list, behind cycling and swimming, and in others, it's very close to the top. Keep searching and you will find a top 10 where horse riding is the number one. You'll also find that the number one cause of household accidents is slippers. The number one animal killer is the sheep. Apparently they knock into the back of a farmer's knees and the poor farmer then hits his head on the floor, apparently. And the number one issue with immigration is benefit fraud. Or maybe the number one issue with immigration is the number of hospital staff and care workers. Who knows? But then, even in a list where horse riding is the number one dangerous activity, what would you class as horse riding? An activity? A sport? Are we looking at top level eventing? Show jumping? Rodeo? Jousting? Or happy hackers? or horse logging. And what exactly do we mean by dangerous? The number of fatalities or reported accidents? How about unreported accidents? How about anecdotal accidents? Or our friend's tale of almost accidents, weaving a narrative of bravery and amusement to fill in a lull in tall tales told over half a shandy. The fact is, Keep searching enough or wait long enough and you will find a study to back up your presuppositions and beliefs. If one believes horses are dangerous in the first place, that's good enough. The facts will be out there for you to find. Soon enough, there will be a study to show that five pieces of fruit are not good for you. It will be ten or none. Soon enough there will be a study to show that drinking eight glasses of water is not good, that tea is hydrating, or fluoride in water is bad for the teeth. Wait long enough and you will find a study to back up your presuppositions and beliefs. We all remember the study that said red wine is good for your health, don't we? But we must entertain the slim possibility the concept which must not be uttered, the quiet thought which is swamped in the well-meaning cacophony of tales of fear-smelling broncos, stories of behaviour-altering brain tumours and cautions of hospital-filling chestnut mares. We must entertain the possibility that possibly, just possibly, horses are safe. It's a possibility that whispers and never shouts, but it whispers with an irrefutable confidence in its own existence. If we can quiet the noise of those who surround us, and I include Facebook posts, social media awareness campaigns, news reports, and 24 hours in A&E, we can take note of the possibility that horses are safe. Horses are safe. 
even, perhaps even more than that, horses are fun. Yes, fun. Remember that? We must remember what brought us to horse riding in the first place. The mental image of how we would like to be that first brought us to the saddle. A mental image probably formed in our childhood years of beaches and wind and hair. None of us are forced to ride horses. Very few leisure riders are forced to ride. We do it for the pleasure, the fun and the enjoyment. How often do we allow ourselves to remember that this is the purpose of horse riding? If you don't like horse riding, there are plenty of other hobbies out there. Tennis, swimming, cycling, watercolours and the tuba are all there for us. No one has to ride horses unless they want to. Too many riders return from a ride with the only emotion being filled with a relief that they're still alive. And that's no fun at all. In fact, the very opposite of fun. Yet here we are, spending huge amounts of money and time. We forget to acknowledge to ourselves that we are doing this because it's fun. Because we love it. Because it makes us feel good. But honestly, when did you last say that about your horses and riding? That simple acknowledgement can turn around our outlook and make the whole experience of riding vibrant and enjoyable again. If you can genuinely look inside yourself and find no fun or pleasure in riding horses, then stop. If there is a joy, however, then why not focus on it? You always get more of what you focus on, so it'll be nice to get more pleasure. In conversation that I either have myself, hearing my clients or observe riders having between themselves, either on social media, in the pages of magazines or riders just chatting generally, the perception of dangers of horse riding is at odds with my own experience in the professional day-to-day -day career. Forgive me, I get so passionate about my subject matter that I completely forgot to introduce myself. My name is Carl Greenwood and I am a hypnotherapist and stunt rider. We also teach the sports of horseback archery and jigitovka, a Russian sport of sword, lance, pistol, throwing knife, archery and gymnastics, all off the back of a horse, and take trick riding, jigitovka and jousting shows out to entertain at county shows, castles and royal shows. It all sounds very exciting and jolly brave. And the action photos and articles and pictures that adorn our walls bear testament to our experiences from the so-called extremes of horse riding. As a consequence of our experience, I, along with my wife Sana, were able to create a one-off rider confidence course currently running in Hemel Hempstead in Hertfordshire, a unique combination of hypnotherapy and practical exercises on trained stunt horses to show everyday riders how to cope with rears and spins and falls. The course is a great success and has helped many riders regain their perspective on riding and return to enjoying their horses. I digress. As I was saying before I rudely interrupted myself, the general public perception of the dangers of horse riding is at odds with my own experiences in my professional day-to-day -day career. Very at odds. In fact, almost the very opposite. The dangers of horse riding, even in the extremes, is simply not anything like the level that is perpetuated and propagated as a fact across the leisure horse community. And it's not just me and my industry. Wherever people work professionally with horses, the opinion is that horses are not intrinsically dangerous. However, the first thing I need to get across to clients, online forums and communities of other riders is that we are not brave. We are, however, experienced risk assessors. We have contingency plans, trained for the job, and we keep ourselves trained for that job. And from our career perspective, we can help you with your horse riding. But we're not brave. It's just that riding horses in conditions that some may view as extreme is our day-to-day -day life. I don't know what you do for a living, but I do know that if I was to come into your work, 
I would be feeling just as nervous as the people who come into my stables, especially if your jobs had actual real world consequences, such as working in finance or education or in hospitals. Very, subjectively, scary stuff. But hopefully, under your guidance, with your friendship, at the end of the day, I'd be happily working away with you, feeling confident and putting all the right components in the right places. The second thing that we have to get into both our conscious and subconscious minds, as suggested earlier, is that horses are not intrinsically dangerous. In fact, I will go further. Horses are safe. Fundamentally, horses are safe. They are. That's why we ride them. And it's why we've ridden them for thousands of years. And that's why we don't ride, say, lions. Don't come on my lion riding confidence course. It's rubbish. My lion riding confidence course does really, really badly and for a very good reason. 10,000 years ago when one villager said, I'm going to try and ride Dobbin to work. And the other villager said, I'm going to try and ride Leo to work. Well, only one of them came back. And that's when we realised horses are safe. Lions are not safe, but horses are safe. That's why we ride them and we don't ride lions. We ride horses for a reason. Us and millions of people over countless centuries. Now I know there will be a queue of riders with their own stories of disaster to refute my claim that horses are safe. However, horses are safe in the same way as Volvos are safe, or air travel is safe. We've all seen stories of aeroplane disasters on the news, and Volvo could not put out an advert which specifically said Volvos are safe because someone somewhere would pop up with a story of their uncle Jeff who walks with a permanent limp now. But the common knowledge is that Volvos and air travel are safe. Horses are also safe. What we are saying in all three cases is that in the vast, 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 vast majority of journeys, Volvos and aeroplanes are safe, as are horses. Not only are horses safe, but they're getting safer. Us leisure riders don't really need horses to get to work and back again. We've basically only got the leisure and sport industry left. So the leisure horses are the bloodlines that the breeders are interested in. It's simply supply and demand that means that on the whole, the good leisure horses are the lines that will be bred from, the screaming stallion that killed everybody but say was really good at pulling a coal barge for a week and a half on nothing but a bucket full of grain isn't really of use anymore, so his bloodlines have faded out through not having a market. Please, before draft horse enthusiasts, before you start writing, I, I know. I digress. It's a fact that supply and demand means that inevitably horses are being bred safer and safer for the leisure market in this industry. Not only are the horses being bred safer to fulfil the supply and demand chain, but the equipment we use with our equines is getting safer too. We have safety stirrups, non-slip numbers, ergonomic girths, better designed, fitted and manufactured bits, high-vis jackets. The list goes on and on. On. The future holds ever more increasing technological advances to make things even safer. Air jackets, 3D scanning saddle trees, carbon fibre motion absorbing technologies, the list goes on in ever improving ways. And all of this is making horses safer and safer. Furthermore, we have ever improving comprehensive research into animal comfort and psychology, training programmes and training systems. We understand animal psychology better, and we have greater resources of information on Google and ebooks and in references than we have ever had before. Even on a personal level, our general knowledge as riders is so much more than it used to be. 
If a horse is misbehaving now, anybody you will ask will automatically say, check its saddle, check its tack, check its teeth. Because we are so much more better informed. And that never happened when I was a kid. Even when things do go wrong, we are so much more better protected and prepared than we have ever been before. Back protectors, air jackets, safety hats, kite mark standards, stirrup levers that come off the saddle and safety stirrups all go to averting risk. As well as acknowledging that horses are safe and getting safer, and our personal protection is making riding safer, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that even when it does go wrong, we are usually fine anyway. As you've sat listening to this book for the last half hour, given that most of the world doesn't have the nice lifestyle that we have with the luxury of cars and roads and electricity, but instead relies 100% on their equines, horses, mules, donkeys, to carry on their lives and work, how many of those millions of people currently interacting with their equines have suffered some sort of negative interaction today? A small proportion of a large number of horse people is, however, a significant number of people. So in the last half hour, hundreds if not thousands of people have for certain fallen off, been trodden on, kicked, barged through, squashed against the wall, dropped their packs, turned the cart over, slipped on a rock, whatever. These things happen, and they've happened to people today, right now, with no safety hats or jackets or special training or anything whatsoever. And did these people die? No. They got back on their horses and carried on their day, with hardly an after-dinner anecdote to tell the family. This tiny percentage of horse people is still in the hundreds, if not thousands, of the millions working on their equines at this very moment. Many people every day have mishaps with horses and there is nothing to report because even when it goes wrong, it's usually fine. If it wasn't fine, if tens of thousands of people died or were injured by their equines every day, don't you think we'd know? But it doesn't because they don't. They don't because horses are safe. And that's just in the last half hour. We've been riding horses for thousands of years. How many millions and billions of journeys have been completed without incident from those millions of people over millions of days? And as already mentioned, even when it went wrong, it was usually fine. Possibly in a Jane Austen novel, the returning Avenger galloped over the windswept moor on a stormy night, the clanging of the storm bells of his abandoned ship being carried mournfully by the howling wind like the pallbearers of doom. His horse put its foot in a hole and the antagonist was flung from his horse, killing him instantly. But that is called a plot device. It is not a documentary. A plot device is everything to do with arranging for the hero and the heroine to find their destinies, clasping hands to bosom and breathlessly declaring undying passion. And nothing to do with the factual day-to-day -day life of millions of horse riders taking millions of journeys, the vast majority without incident and the vast majority of those remaining journeys with incidents being absolutely fine. We even have our own life experiences to fall back on in this regard. How many rides have you been on in your life? A hundred? More? And of each hundred rides, how many resulted in an injury? Not a bruise or a shock, but an actual injury. One per hundred? One percent? Less than one per hundred. Less than one percent. That's an over 99% success rate. So how about if we only include injuries that actually sent you to hospital? Most falls, as we've already mentioned, turn out to be fine anyway. So only counting the falls that sent you to hospital, what's your success rate? For some, 
That's a 100% success rate, and yet they will still describe themselves as likely to fall or get hurt. 99% to 100% successful rider versus 0 to 1% victim. <laughs> it only took 52% to stop us being European. So firstly, horses are safe and getting safer. And secondly, even when it does go wrong, it's fine for the vast, vast, vast majority of the time. When lion riding goes wrong, that's different. My lion riding course sells really, really badly. You are more capable than you realize. So you don't need to be brave and horses are safe and they're getting safer. And even when it does go wrong, it's fine in the overwhelmingly vast majority of the time, even if we don't take any action. The next thing that we need to introduce to our subconscious mind is that when it does go wrong and we do have to take action, when we do have to stop a situation turning into a mess, we already have the ability to cope. Out on our horses, when the time comes to take action to minimize the risk, riders tend to freeze rather than to act. Why is that, do you think? Why would we freeze rather than take action? One possible reason is that in our sheltered lives, we so rarely find ourselves in a life or death situation that when we do find ourselves on our horses with the potentially fatal consequences if we mess it up, we're overwhelmed and unable to act. It's as though we cannot act. Why is that, do you think? One common answer brings up the fact that serious life or death situations seldom occur in everyday life, and therefore we seize up. How does that sound? I'd say it sounds plausible. But then I'd go on to say, what nonsense. We cope with life and death situations all the time, every day, perfectly easy and perfectly capably. Let me give an example. Take swimming. We all know how potentially dangerous water can be, especially if it's unfamiliar waters in an unfamiliar place. And yet, even though we're aware of the danger, and even though we're aware of the terrible trouble we could find ourselves in, nonetheless, we will happily spend thousands of pounds and travel thousands of miles to unfamiliar seas where the water is warm so we can spend even longer bathing in it. Of course, we take sensible precautions to make sure that we can cope with this life and death situation. We will ask at the hotel where the safe place to swim in, we will be aware of the signs on the beach and we will swim between the flags where there's a lifeguard or whatever. And if this example doesn't resonate with you, if you don't swim, there is no shortage of life and death situations which you can cope with all the time to choose from instead. Riding a bicycle, crossing the road, driving a car, walking down the stairs in a pair of novelty slippers, any one of these situations could end in disaster, but they don't. Why not? Because you take the correct precautions to make sure you're safe. And furthermore, you think nothing of it. Let's take driving as an example. If you don't drive, then think of riding a bicycle, crossing the street, whatever. The mental process is the same. Okay, so you're driving down the motorway. You come to your junction, and it's one of those big junctions with a huge slip road, going up to a major roundabout. Six possible lanes of traffic and you have to drive onto the roundabout and continue your journey. Automatically, you take sensible precautions to make sure you bring this experience into your ability to ensure success. You feel your level of arousal raise. Maybe a feeling of adrenaline will begin as you realize that it's time to take decisive action. You adapt your surroundings to increase the chances of success, maybe turn down the radio or call over your shoulder, 
Shut up, kids, I've got to concentrate. You do whatever it is to match your actions to your state of arousal to cope with the situation you found yourself in. And you do cope easily with the life and death situation that you are now coming into. Your state of arousal is up. You start to assess the multitude of factors that you now have to deal with. You take notice of the potential dangers. Notice, for example, any large lorries on one side or the other of you, or both. You have to be aware of the road signs so you can get in the correct lane and all the other signs advising road conditions. And at the same time, become aware that if the traffic lights are on green, and traffic lights on green is the worst one because you can never judge if they will have changed to red by the time you get there. You check in your rear view mirror that the car behind you isn't too close in case the lights change to red and you have to stop. Read the paint on the road, change your gears, swap your lane, etc, etc. You find the gap in the traffic, change your lane, anticipate where your opportunity to pull onto the roundabout is. Even though you're heading into a potentially dangerous situation, you have every faith in your ability to negotiate that situation and carry on your journey to work or to see your mum or whatever or whatever. And you use these abilities irrelevant of the fact that you can feel the adrenaline increase in your body as you enter a potentially dangerous situation. What you don't do is think, it'll be all right, positive thinking kids, I've read a book on the law of attraction and the universe will look after us. Put a paper bag on your head, press the pedal to the floor, trusting in the universe and a positive mindset to glide you across the junction in a cloud of confidence. It doesn't work like that. Your confidence is in you, not the situation, not the universe. Your confidence is in you and it is not swayed by the presence or absence of adrenaline. You have absolute confidence in negotiating this junction, just as you did with the last junction and just as you will do with the next 10 or 20 junctions. You are 100% confident in your abilities. And interestingly, this is still the case even if you refer to yourself as an unconfident driver. And it's the same for riding a bicycle and crossing the road and innumerable other situations. If you mess it up, you will make a real mess. So you don't. Therefore, it follows that if you can cope in that life and death situation, or this life and death situation, and you can, and you have, and you do, on a regular basis, then what's the difference with coping when in a situation with your horse? Aha, my clients say at this point, the difference is that my horse has a mind of its own. Well, as you may expect by now, please allow me to retort. When you get into the car as a passenger and you ask the driver if it would be necessary to put on your seatbelt, it is very seldom that the driver will turn to you and say, oh yes, buckle up. I tell you now, I'm a really bad driver. Very seldom do they say that. Usually what they say is something like, oh yes, put your seatbelt on. It's not me. It's that you don't know what nutters are out there. Exactly. Let's just take a moment to think about exactly what that statement implies here. So what we are saying is that we are perfectly happy to contemplate the thought that out on the road there may be up to four million drivers, any one of which could be a complete nutter, each in charge of half a ton of metal and explosive liquid travelling at speeds at up to 100 miles an hour. We agree that we are quite prepared to cope with that. But when we are presented with our horse, who has a brain the size of a broad bean and will do exactly the same predictably unpredictable things day in and day out, suddenly we say, oh, but it's got a mind of its own and we can't cope. What nonsense. We clearly can cope. It's just that we have to make the decision to cope. Like we do, when we drive in amongst other drivers. 
Please allow me to continue the driving analogy a little further. It won't be long, I promise. We'll make our way back to the horses soon. So on your way around your daily life, I expect you travel quite a lot in a car. To work, to the shops, you know, normal stuff. And on your way to your destination, of course, you engage in a series of spectacular, brave and amazing stunts during your journey. Of course you did. Travelling along a single carriageway road at 60 miles an hour, lorries coming the other way at 60 miles an hour, closing speed of 120 miles an hour, and you pass so close that if both drivers stretched out their hands, they could probably high-five each other as they went past. Wow! Amazing! Of course, the reality is that you drive past traffic at 60 miles an hour all the time and think nothing of it. If we were to change the frame of reference, you can fully appreciate your acts of skill and daring do. I certainly do. Let's have a closer look at what you do so capably. Let's just reframe this particular stunt by taking this particular piece of action to the vast deserts in America, where they attempt land speed records on long, smooth, vast, flat, dried lake beds. OK, here we are. It's hot, it's dry, and the hard-baked ground is as flat as a mill pond in all directions. Heat hazes rise to make a mirage of water and probably a lizard will skitter somewhere because lizards like a cliché as much as the next reptile. You get the idea. In this dead, flat landscape, we will put the lorry up there on the horizon, shimmering through the distorted heat thermals of air. You can get into this lovely Ford Ka down here. The radio looping to a slow and mournful Midwest slide guitar riff. On the word action, you accelerate rapidly up to 60 miles an hour towards the lorry across this vast dried up ancient lake bed. The lorry is accelerating up to 60 miles an hour towards you. Thick clouds of dust spiralling away behind the ever accelerating juggernaut as it speeds towards you. It's closing speed of 120 miles an hour in the middle of this vast lake bed. You are to drive past each other so close that if you leant out, you could high-five the driver. Wow. Given this new frame of reference, you would undoubtedly demand stunt wages for this particular piece of action. Let's up the ante even more. Now, there's no Ford Ka. There's just you, standing in the desert, twiddling your thumbs and sweating in the heat. Lizards skitter over your worn cowboy boots. If you squint against the glare of the sun and through the haze, you can just see, shimmering on the horizon, the mechanics changing the engine of the lorry for an enhanced racing engine, one which will now go at 120 miles an hour towards you. In climbs the driver, and for the first few seconds you find it difficult to fathom the exact moment of the lorry starting to head towards you, until the haze of dust thickens and begins to rotate behind the cab. You now see signs of movement as the lorry seems to creep imperceptibly closer, clouds of thick spiralling dust obscuring the horizon like an avenging demon. Suddenly your perceptions realise that the speed of the thing, the huge lorry careering towards you, 60, 70, 80, eerily silent, 90, closer and closer, the roar of the engine suddenly arising like a storm cloud, 100, 120, bearing down on you on where you stand, and, 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 <sighs> zooming past you at 120 miles an hour, so close that you could lean over and high-five the driver. Well, you would certainly want stunt wages for that, don't you think? And yet, you do the same thing all the time, every day, 
without even thinking about it. If we can reframe one simple safe everyday action to appear more dangerous than it is, then we can go the other way and reframe something that we are perceiving as dangerous back down to the simple, safe, everyday action that it is. It's a fact that when I ask, most of my clients will say that they used to be more confident than they are today. However, the actions they are doing today, jumping, trotting, cantering or whatever, are exactly the same actions that they did when they were confident. Therefore, somehow, between then and now, somewhere along the line, they have reframed those actions from being everyday actions into being something more dangerous than it truly is. So, if you can reframe in one direction, then you can reframe in the other direction too. Just as my persuasive words showed you how you could perceive something to be either everyday or dangerous, so somebody's persuasive words have persuaded you that the safe and everyday actions of horse riding is somehow more dangerous than it is. Who's been doing that? Reframing your hobby for you. The thing you love to do. I'm sorry to say, it's the people who have your best interests at heart. It's the people you surround yourself with, the friends who want to share their nervousness with you, the feeders and relishers of your and their limitations and anxiety. It's also the posts you read on Facebook, social media, internet journalism and the stories of disaster and the gossip and speculation and dramatization and sometimes pure fiction that surrounds the equine environment. You were lucky. We have already considered the thousands of people who have fallen off even whilst we read this book and just get up again and get on with their day. The normal outcome of falling from your horse is that you get up and get on with your day. That is the usual outcome. But Facebook groups, awareness campaigns and horse magazines trying to shift a few journals or even well-meaning friends trying to be supportive will supportively chastise us in a very serious voice. Ooh, that could have been nasty. You were lucky. No, you were not lucky. You were normal. Riders get on, riders fall off, riders get on again, and riders fall off again. And that's what happens. And as the thousands of people all around the world currently working their equines show us, it's normal not to be hurt. Overwhelmingly normal not to be hurt. Don't get me wrong, bad luck does happen. Bad luck might happen on horses, passing lorries, in Volvos and on aeroplanes. But on the whole, in the vastly larger majority of rides, drives, flights and interactions, nothing untowards happens. When your ride on your horse heads south unexpectedly, in the vast, 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 vast majority of cases, the rider is unhurt and all that happens is the rider gets back on. You can imagine that in our work at the centre of horseback combat and in filming and in jousting shows and trick riding shows, we fall off a lot. Yes, it happens. Sometimes on purpose and with a wage for it, but of course, sometimes accidentally too. If someone was to come in the door of the Centre of Horseback Combat now and announce to the room, Zana's fallen off. 
how do you think the room would react? Well, first things first, we would obviously inquire as to the outcome of the fall. Oh, is she all right? Yes. A confused silence would follow because that's the reaction it deserves. Uh, well, can you go and get on with it, please? I'm trying to record a book here. Compare that reaction to the reaction from your typical livery yard. The door bursts open, our excited informant comes flying into the room and declares loudly, Oh my God, Sam's fallen off! All the coffee goes up in the air. Everybody rushes out. Sam, 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 are you all right? Sam's coming down the path, leading Rocky, tears cascading. I'm OK, I'm OK, I'm just a bit shocked. And there'll be clucking and fussing and drama and what ifing and everything else. And you can be sure that somebody will be running around saying, Ooh, you were lucky. No, you weren't lucky. You were normal. It's normal not to be hurt. There's normal and there's unlucky. Beware who you surround yourself with. And don't forget to include those Facebook posts from horse magazines, the articles that seem to be absolutely dedicated to making us terrified of horse riding. These cheap rag spin-offs trawl the world through millions of uneventful horse rides across the globe to find those bad luck tales and put them right in front of us in our living rooms every day. These stories will do the rounds, get picked up over and over again. Quite often you will find a horror story doing the rounds and it takes someone in the comments to point out, hang on, this was six years ago. Horse Magazine's Facebook posts are literally trawling all of time and space to make out that horses are dangerous. Magazines, road awareness groups, individuals wanting to seem exciting. Invite these posts into your life with extreme caution. They are not there to help you. Paralympian in horror fall. There was one particular Facebook post from last year. It sticks in my mind because it was so typical of the nonsense that gets bandied about. You may have seen it. The title was Paralympian in Horror Fall. Not just horror, but horror in capitals. Horror. On reading further, it transpires that a Paralympian in Rio with cerebral palsy had been in the arena when her horse had spooked and had fallen from her horse. The officials in the arena immediately ran to her aid and as a precaution concealed any potential drama with a screen. She was duly taken to hospital. In her own words, the staff at the arena and the staff at the hospital were simply great. She was treated quickly, efficiently and well and when all was said and done, her injury was a bruised ankle. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had cerebral palsy and I had fallen from a spooky horse and ended up with a bruised ankle, well, I would consider that a dream fall. Just the kind of fall you were hoping for, except for the bruising. But the title ran Paralympian in Horror Fall. Sensationalism. Here's another thing. Sometimes it's irrelevant if the original post is sensible or not because the comments posted underneath from all the world and sundry whip themselves up into an absolute frenzy. One particular post was from a friend of mine who had a rotational fall at a cross-country fence and the horse had rolled onto and over her leg. The rider very capably jumped up and jumped on, set off and completed the course. About a year later, Facebook put up one of those share a memory from a year ago posts. Perhaps a different mood had settled on her, but for some reason this particular girl, who should have known better, put up the video with the caption, I can't believe I walked away. The comments below went into meltdown. Oh my God, you were so lucky. That happened to my mum. Thank God she had her riding hat on and back protector on and the horse rolled right over her legs. And pages and pages of exclamations and drama 
Peaches of Disaster and Tales of Trauma. And since then, I've always wondered exactly how does a hat and back protector help her mum's legs? I digress. Expressing our own fears in tenuous links to irrelevant articles in such a public place as social media really won't help anyone ride more safely. It just sends our anxieties up. People like to grab drama and play the what-if game. People spread and exaggerate tales to paint themselves as the hero, the bravest, the luckiest, the unluckiest, or the most daring. But ultimately, it's to our detriment if we take any value to them other than a vacuous comment offered for no reason other than to offer a reaction. My friend wasn't lucky. She was normal. And so was her friend's mum. The normal outcome of falling off, rearing, falling over is that you're fine. Why not do as I do and amuse yourself by reading into these posts and articles when they occur, reading past the emotion and distilling out the facts? You'll see these ludicrous posts and comments everywhere, simply everywhere, including in the conversations you have with other riders. The vast, vast, vast outcome of riding horses is just that you get to go where you're going. And even in the very small percentage where something goes wrong, overwhelmingly, you're fine. But please, don't apply that to riding lions.